This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you looked at my first posting on Facebook or my YouTube page today, you know that there was a bit of a glitch, thus the late posting of this. But I'm so glad to welcome you to our virtual worship. Um, ordinarily, and I tried this morning, we have a congregate of building pews with actual people in them for in-person worship and record at the same time. Unfortunately, uh, one of those moments, my brain just wasn't working right. And so things are going to seem a little bit different this morning, uh, just simply because, or I should say by now, this afternoon, uh, because of the technical difficulties, shall we say. But I'm so glad you came back to join us and I welcome you here virtually as, uh, as I do a little bit of a throwback to the way I started out in this, um, doing kind of a solo recording until we were able to be at worship in person. So I'm glad you're with us, and I think it's important that we begin first and foremost with the opportunity to make ourselves right with God as we do our confession and hear God's word of promise and hope and especially his forgiveness of sins. So let us begin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose teaching is light, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. And now pray with me as we confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. O God, our Comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and we see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and our own greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Scripture declares that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we are made righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is when we would ordinarily have an opening hymn, and we did at in-person worship, O oh Master, let me walk with you. I don't know how to make music happen on these videos, so let's just move on. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us join our hearts together in the prayer of the day. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Three readings mark this day, and the first one is from the prophet Jeremiah. In the 11th chapter, beginning in the 18th verse, speaking on behalf of God, and yet also on behalf of himself in earnest prayer, as he speaks these words for all of us to hear. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. And then you showed me their evil deeds. 
But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. And I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now our second reading is a continuation in the uh, book of James. This is our uh, fourth installment, if you will, of uh, readings from James, and it will provide the base for our meditation this morning. This is from the third and fourth chapters of the book of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. These conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have, so you commit murder. You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your own pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And finally, we turn our attention to the Gospel reading. The Holy Gospel for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. They went on from Caesarea Philippi, and they passed through Galilee. Now Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying. They were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, What were you arguing about along the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another as to who was the greatest. He sat down. He called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking the child in his arms, Jesus said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me,
but the one who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the opening chapter of his gospel, St. John the Evangelist declares, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. With these words called the Incarnation Gospel, we hear from John something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is the Christmas season. Are we a little bit early or are we way late? Doesn't matter. But it is that word of God that became flesh dwelling among us who brought us the fullness of God, the grace of God, and what James alludes to, James alludes to, the truth that God has for each of us. As I said, for, the, for three weeks now, we have had a reading and a meditation based upon the book of James. I started this out, and it has been a tremendous challenge on the one hand, and yet a remarkably enlightening experience for me in bringing you the power of the word. Today we have installment number four, and we will conclude our mini-series, if you will, next week with the fifth installment. But over the past several weeks, I have brought some pieces to you that are part of my, the core of my own theology as I examined and compared the theology of James against me as a Lutheran pastor being rooted and grounded in those letters of Paul. Sometimes, and I'm repeating myself, I know, but sometimes we look upon the book of James and we kind of see a conflict going on between, the, between James and the works and practical wisdom that he brings to us and the Apostle Paul who attributes our salvation to grace alone as a gift from God through Jesus Christ. But I've also said over the past couple of weeks that we need not look at James as a Christological treatise. That means that um, it not as something that identifies and reiterates or, or emphasizes Jesus' teaching as well as the, the law and the prophets and all of those things, but is actually, and especially in this middle portion that we are in right now, is a book of wisdom. Now, as a book of wisdom, it is practical teaching in practical ways of how God's work is placed into our hands. And I know I did use that just a couple of weeks ago, leading toward today, this Sunday, across the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Today, this Sunday, the 19th of September, is God's Work, Our Hands Sunday. And so how appropriate that this would come to us talking about our hands as being instruments of God's love and mercy. I don't know whether you can see it from way back there, but that's why oftentimes we have had hands on the cover of our bulletins over these past couple of weeks. Next week, hands will appear on it again as we look toward prayer as a part of our Christian experience living life. 
But today I want to bring a few things to the fore that have to do with an understanding of James as a piece of wisdom literature. Those conflicts and disputes among you, James asks, where do they come from? Do they not come from cravings that are at war within you? Now, I've talked before about this, this battle within. <clears throat> we are born children of a fallen humanity. In each of us dwells the old Eve, the old Adam, the one that needs to and is in the waters of holy baptism put to death in order that God can create within us and through us by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, a new you, a new you that is in oneness with God through Jesus, evidenced by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so there is this battle that goes on in inside of us. And James calls us to examine some of these things. All too often it seems that our conflicts grow out of our desires to have our own way. It began in the Garden of Eden, the desire to be like God. And it has continued all the way to our present day. No matter what your ilk, your walk in life, all of these disputes are rooted in our desire to have our own way. Now sometimes, yes, our way is righteous, but at other times maybe not so righteous. I've been here at Christ Lutheran for over 10 years. We are, we are in the midst of our 11th year together. And the truth be told, I've done a little bit of historical research on this congregation, let alone experiencing the past 10 years. And lo and behold, I have found that from time to time, like every other con congregation I've served or been a member of, conflicts arise. Our motivation is not always pure. Yes, sometimes, but sometimes it goes back to that original problem that we have, that desire to have our own way. We want it our way, my way, or the highway. James calls the people of God to set aside themselves, and that's the power of his writing. James calls the people of God to set themselves aside in order to seek the good of the whole community, to strive to, to build up the body of Christ. Now in some cases, yes, I suppose you could translate that into numbers, but that isn't the point that he is making. Maybe the body of Christ, the greatest challenge of all is to find a way to talk together openly and honestly about those differences. And still in the end, maybe because of, and maybe sometimes despite our differences, to be that body of Christ. And if we're truly honest with ourselves, we don't even have to look just at the conflicts that occur in worshiping congregations. It can be in families. It can be in, in communities. It can be in the neighborhood. It can be issues of this or issues of that. It can be in the politics that, that we choose to follow. It can be in our social uh, socioeconomic group, the haves and the have-nots, all of these sorts of things. But what James is doing is saying, who is wise among you? If you're wise, 
Why do these conflicts come up? True wisdom, true wisdom is to follow in the ways to which God calls us, sometimes presenting us with challenges. Now, the apostle, uh, the apostle, the apostle James, the author of the book, Our Focus, for today in the past three weeks, the focus has always been on practical application. Last Sunday, it was something as small and simple as your tongue. A small thing. And he compares it practically, once again, because that's what wisdom does, is to move us in a direction to realize that even the smallest of our members can do great things members of our body and members of the body of Christ. And so he wants us to be unified, not according to what we want, but according to what God calls us, leads us, and sometimes, I dare say, forces us into. We are facing that as a challenge in our own life right now. My wife and I in dealing with aging parents, news about relatives who are going to be going through great suffering. And it's difficult for us in this day and age. Our prayers are still being asked. And we're trusting God to respond in His time and not ours. That's our desire to have it God's way. Now that also means that <clears throat> my lovely bride and I, her siblings and extended family, my own siblings and uh, my extended family, we don't always necessarily agree. But wisdom teaches us that even if we never agree, doesn't mean that we can't have respect for one another. That's what James is after here. He's not after some way to convince you about Christ. He's not trying to convert you, to proselytize you into some sort of a new world, but simply in the practical application of the wisdom that God has chosen to place within your heart in order that you can use your hands, tiny little things by comparison, but put them to work as if it is, because it is God's work. God's work, our hands. In so many words, you will know wisdom by its fruit. Now that's something that is, as usual, James's theology is practical and down to earth. And precisely because wisdom's uh, uh, insights are so practical, they're about doing things, Readers with a religious interest are often prone to just shun it for its insights, to, to cast aside this book as not particularly theological. But that is the way of wisdom. Wisdom assumes that because it's the supreme gift of God to human beings, reflection on the religious life and what it means is to live in relationship to God. And that relationship is always going to reveal itself as something practical. We can talk about, we can theologize about all of the spiritual aspects. But according to James, if his concept and his idea of wisdom holds true, it is always going to be in the practical application of that relationship with God. It points to a 
to a fullness of life, exercised in a disciplined love and care for the neighbor. Spirituality is not a matter of escape from this world, dear friends, but it is to be exercised most visibly in a healthy life of interaction with the day-to-day -day affairs of this world. Did you get all that? Spirituality is not a matter of escape from this world. It is exercised in the day-to-day -day events of our lives. And to use that wisdom, our experiences of life, watching a good woman or a good man, following some of their practices, some of the things they do. I just shared with counsel last Monday night that in the midst of all of this these family issues that we are going through right now, I have found a comfort and a peace exemplified by one of our members who every week takes our prayer list from our bulletin and goes through each and every name by name on a daily basis. Praise for them asks for help, healing, good news, good spirits, comfort in grief, safety as they serve in our armed forces, in all of these sorts of ways, to remember these people in prayer. I shared with counsel, I needed a way in which I could do that. And in the midst of all of this, my prayer life had started to drop off a little bit. Well, I prayed for the big things that I had perceived or that I had been asked to pray for, but it doesn't take long to get out of that practice. Returning to formula prayers and those sorts of and so wisdom is a practical gift that even in that, that personal moment, nevertheless, I find myself looking outward toward the community, those folks that I've come to know, some people I don't even know, and yet finding myself connected with them in ways in which God draws me into it. Should it be surprising that the, the gifts that James reports aren't a whole lot different than those qualities that, the, that St. Paul identifies as, as the fruit of the Spirit? James reads here, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Listen again to St. Paul's list the fruits of the Spirit out of his fifth chapter of his, his epistle to the Galatians. Galatians identifies as the fruit of the Spirit these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what I think is the nearness to God that James is talking about in the 7th and 8th verses. It, it all has to do with these gifts and their practical application to boot. We will be inspired to that exercise of wisdom in humility. 
in making those fine choices that are born of wisdom and not of our own desires, that lead us to a kind of harvest as righteousness, harvest of righteousness that James calls for, seen in those down-to-earth, practical, peaceful human relationships. This is really what it's all about. As I was preparing for today, I couldn't help but go back to that, that tiny little thing called the tongue. And remembered from my, from my youth the famous old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. They aren't so true. Words hurt. Words stay with us. That pain becomes kind of a, a, a thorn in our flesh, something that we need to let go of so that we can live our lives in that peaceable harvest of righteousness of which James speaks. Perhaps you've experienced some of the same things. Perhaps you too can recall those moments from playmates in your neighborhood growing up, classmates at school, maybe from a sibling, a sister, or a brother, or yeah, maybe even sometimes from parents. Now, as a parent, I'll never let that kind of talk come out of my mouth. <laughs> it happens. Because that war still goes on within us. And that war is only going to be, be defeated when once and for all, we are reunited with all the saints in heaven. And so James is also in that wisdom looking forward to that future hope. And we, as Christians, steeped in the theology of the Apostle Paul, know that it is through Christ alone, the power of God's Word revealed in Christ, which gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we become workers with one another in the kingdom of God, a kingdom for here and now in all its practicality. And its a kingdom that lasts forever and ever. So my dear friends, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. I will tell you that our hymn of the day was the, the delightful hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father. And when we were in person, I hearken back to the Red Green Show because I love his line. Remember, I'm calling for you. We're all in this together. You are a child of God, marked with the cross of Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And as we say in the baptismal liturgy, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Then we sing, Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in his bosom gather, nestling bird or star of heaven, such a refuge e'er was given. God his own doth tend and nourish, in his holy courts they flourish, from all evil things he spares them. In his mighty arms he bears them. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaketh. Is the loving purpose solely to preserve them, to preserve you, pure and holy. Amen.
And now, dear friends, join with me as we share together our profession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. And now I invite you to come together with me in prayer because we are made children and heirs of God's promises. Be with me as we pray for the church, for the world, and all who are in need. Each of our petitions will end with the simple phrase, Lord, in your mercy, and the response is, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray for the church in its many expressions. Give it the gift of discernment to know what is needed and the humility to ask for what is necessary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that our world may not continue in ignorance, but discern what is truly good and just, and that all political leaders might seek the common good and practice genuine care for the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray that we might be generous in giving, compassionate in serving, and sensitive in understanding the needs of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort and care, make your healing presence known to those who are hospitalized or sick, especially Gwen, Sue, Jay, Janet, Daniel, Nancy, Phyllis, Eileen, Jerry, Mary, and those whom we name in our hearts. That by your Holy Spirit, they would experience a sense of healing and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that all people might receive a hope strong enough to endure all the trials all their fears, and all the discouragement that this world may bring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we give thanks for the saints and all those who have seasoned our lives of faith. Preserve us in that faith until we join them in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, we pray, and those in our hearts, known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I want to thank you, one and all, for sharing together in this moment of worship. And I pray that God will bless you throughout this week with all wisdom and knowledge to live peaceable lives 
in a sometimes less than peaceable world. And to receive this blessing, this benediction, as from God himself, as he, as I and you together pray, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, dear friends, go in peace, for the living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh,